Welcome everybody uh, to this week's uh, GES seminar. Um, I'm just going to uh, put up on the screen briefly uh, to show what the next couple of seminars are in our series. I'm Andy Miller. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I uh, organized the seminar series for the department, and um, I will then turn it over to Hassan Ahmed, who's one of our master's students here. He will actually introduce the speaker, and then we will turn to Dr. Luis Fernandez. So. Um, I'm just going to share a screen for a moment real quick. Hopefully you can see that. So next week we have Dr. Kelly Kay from UCLA talking about scale, labor, and the Los Angeles Green New Deal plan. And then we have another uh, person from California, Jeannie Lee, who's uh, currently on detail to the White House working on um, updating of the natural, National Environmental Policy Act and her Normal job, she's actually Chief Environmental Lawyer for the state of California. So please join us for that if you're interested. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and I'm gonna turn it over to Hassan. Hassan, uh, go ahead and take it away. And I need to put you on center stage. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Hassan Ahmed, a PhD student at the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems, working with Dr. Matt Fagan. And for today's seminar, we have Dr. Luis E. Fernandez. Uh, he is a research professor of biology at Wake Forest University, a fellow at the Wake Forest University Center for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability, and the executive director of Wake Forest University's Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation located in the Puerto Maldonado, Peru. Since 2006, Dr. Fernandez's research and conservation work has focused on the environmental impacts of artisanal and small-scale gold mining in tropical landscapes in Latin America and Africa, particularly the effects of mercury on contamination caused by mining. He has held professional positions at U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Argonne National Laboratory, the Carnegie Institution for Science and Stanford University, and has served as a science policy consultant for the United Nations, the Secretariat for the Minimata Convention on Mercury, and the U.S. Department of State. His work has been featured on CNN, NPR, Science, Nature, the Washington Post, and other global news outlets. He is currently a visiting investigator at the Department for Global Ecology of Carnegie Institute, Institution for Science at Stanford University and lives in San Francisco, California. So Dr. Luis Fernandez, uh, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna start to share screen. Okay, great. So just confirming that you're seeing my slide. Yes, indeed. Terrific. Thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. And uh, it's uh, it's an honor. Uh, I do want to recognize uh, an old colleague of mine, Matt Baker. Uh, we were in grad school together at the University of Michigan at the School of Natural Resources and Environment, which does have a new name now. Um, and uh, so it's good to be with you all uh, and with Matt. And with another member from the from the department, Pierre Chirko, um, who is uh, Matt's grad uh, grad student, um, so uh, this should be hopefully of interest to many people, um, particularly because it it has two aspects: uh, the the aspect of gold, which is a global commodity which it seems everybody wants, and the Amazon, which is uh, a global focal point for conservation. Uh, and for science, particularly in a climate-affected, climate-changing world. Um, so I'll be talking about how those two uh, important topics uh, intersect uh, through artisanal and small-scale gold mining, which may be um, something that many people haven't heard of. So I'll be describing what ASGM, which is the acronym for artisanal small-scale gold mining, is and, uh, and how that interacts uh, with um, conservation, science, 
and the ability to affect change in uh, tropical frontier regions of Latin America. Um, so just moving on, what you see here is gold. Um, this is what gold looks like after a miner extracts it from the bottom of an Amazonian river um, using uh, essentially technology that is two to 300 years old uh, and uh, a small bottle of liquid elemental mercury. Um, we'll go a little bit into what that looks like, but essentially um, this is this represents 20% of the world's gold supply. Um, um, much of the gold is produced through the action of large companies using modern technology, um, but more than 20% uh, of the world's gold supply um, with up to 50 million people uh, engaged in this enterprise in over 80 countries in the world um, still do it the old fashioned way. So when we talk about the cost of artisanal gold mining, specifically in the Amazon, which is uh, where I'm going to be, uh, where I'm actually working currently, I'm speaking to you from Lima, Peru, where I just came out of the field uh, in Madre de Dios, which is in the uh, Am Peruvian, southern Peruvian Amazon. So when we're talking about what the cost of artisanal gold mining is in the Amazon, we have to specify that a little bit more. We have to understand what is the cost of forests, what is the cost of watersheds, What's the cost of biodiversity? Um, because much of the Amazon looks like this. What you imagine is a unbroken plain of uh, old growth primary rainforests um, and rivers meandering through uh, this, uh, especially in areas that are protected, um, reserves and parks or that are under the, the control of indigenous communities who act as stewards for maintaining the integrity of the biodiversity of these, uh, of these forests. However, there is a dynamic that converts this kind of a landscape to this. Um, and this may be somewhat unrecognizable. Like what exactly are we looking at? Is, is this a river? Is this natural? Um, is this rare? Um, and we'll see that uh, the answers to those questions in the next slide. But for you to try to understand the, the process in which this occurs, um, I have a, a couple short videos that actually takes us, uh, that describes the process of mining and what it is in a very short clip of about 90 seconds. And then a, 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 bit, of a, a bit of a view on the ground of what this actually looks like when you're on a motorbike driving through it. Their illicit two-wheel taxi service is known as Los Tigres. My driver, one of the thousands of young men who have come from all over Peru, lured by an operation that could net $100 a day or get them killed. We ride for 20 minutes before the lush green begins to thin. The jungle floor turns to sand. A half mile further and the rainforest is gone. It's like we've entered a completely different ecosystem from jungle to desert in a matter of feet. Oh, this didn't exist. These lakes didn't exist. Nothing did. It was just flat forest like we went through. This is all man -made. Wow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And these are all toxic, toxic pools now. This is all mining pits that are filled in after it's been abandoned with rainwater. They use an old, brutal method, merciless on the land, cutting down trees, blasting riverbanks with diesel-powered fire hoses, creating a slurry that gets sifted until Eureka, a tiny flake of gold. Since this land only holds two grams of precious metal per ton of mud, mercury is needed to pull the gold from the sludge. And what effect does that mercury have on the living things here, including the people? Well, it's magic for the mining process, but it's poison for everything else. So that, that gives you a sense of what it is, what's the, what's the mechanism of transformation of the landscape. And, it, and it's extraordinarily rapid. Um, so this next clip is just a, a going through it on, a, on some motorbikes and actually it's a drone shots using one of our drones to, to really get a sense of what this is when you're, when you're in it and surrounding. 
uh, surrounded by uh, a, a change when before it was forests with with animals and um, 100 meter trees, uh, and now it's something else. This is a forest three years ago. How long ago? Three years ago. This, my friend, is a mountain. The ponds here are where the mercury accumulates because everything runs off into the low point on the landscape, which is a pond, and also this is where the mercury concentrate is dumped into it during the mining process. So the transformation that, uh, that happens is extraordinarily fast. Uh, this is basically this, the span of two years where basically this frontier of mining pushes forward uh, at, at miles, in some cases, kilometers per day, um, depending on the dynamics of the gold strike. I mean, and, and, and I should specify that this is not a company. These are not organized uh, enterprises, these are basically tens of thousands of individual actors that um, are basically um, finding uh, gold where they can, um, where they hear about, and by basically this rule of thumb. Um, it's very similar to what happened in California in the 1850s um, and, and the Yukon a little later on in Alaska, um, and the techniques are essentially the same. Um, the use of uh, water hoses to blast out alluvial soils, process them using mercury um, because mercury amalgamates with gold very effectively and then releasing it to the environment uh, when the mercury is burned off um, to, to, to basically produce gold. Um, so essentially what we're taking a look at is a process of uh, ecosystem disassembly. Um, from a, I'm, an, I'm a tropical ecologist, I'm a landscape ecologist, and from that perspective, it, the, the, the land use transformation is, is uh, amongst, amongst drivers the most profound, um, where you're not only removing the vegetation, you're mining the soils down to uh, up to 10 meters. Um, and, uh, and as we'll see, you, you actually change the characteristics. So it's not, no longer in many cases, even a terrestrial ecosystem, it becomes an aquatic ecosystem, um, that is, uh, you know, also contaminated with mercury. So we'll, we'll look at the, 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 the difficulties on this. Um, just generally speaking, artisanal gold mining in the Amazon basin is not new. This is something that has been occurring for decades and decades. Um, and it rises and falls with the price of gold, um, which, is con which is a global commodity, mainly uh, controlled outside the region. Um, and yet it drives the behavior of individual actors extraordinarily effectively, since everyone's got a cell phone and they know what the price of gold is in the London markets, uh, just by, uh, you know, even if you have a candy bar phone, you can find out really fast. So. Um, there's a there's a, a, a strong linkage with that price signal that that drives a lot of this, but the the four hotspots in in South America and mainly the the Amazon region or just close to it um, is Guiana. Um, Pete Chirico, who's a who's a colleague of the department, uh, a student of the department, has been doing some work over the last uh, year or so in, in the Guiana Shield area, um, where I've also worked um, in Brazil in the Tapajós region. Um, in um, Colombia, in the north, and, and particularly in the hotspot of Madre de Dios. And that's where um, I do my research and we have my research group there, Cincia. You'll learn more about that and the philosophy behind um, the research program and the applied science work that we're doing for conservation. Uh, but Madre de Dios is, is, uh, is really a, a special place because it is one of the global, it's in the Andes, Amazon um, biodiversity hotspot. Um, it, it has tremendous uh, um, uh, biodiversity um, and protected areas. The jewel of the crown for the Peruvian uh, protected area system, Manu National Park is there, uh, and the Tampapata National Reserve, which is the center of a uh, very uh, important eco, um, ecotourism business. Uh, for Peru, which is the second largest uh, tourist uh, location in Peru after Machu Picchu. Um, its, its, its tagline is capital of biodiversity. However, it is also known as the hotspot for artisanal small-scale gold mining in the Amazon and in South America. So it has basically kind of two faces, two sides of a coin 
um, for uh, for the future of Madre de Dios. Um, and I'll give you a couple of factoids here about ASGM or artisanal gold mining in Madre de Dios. Um, over the last 10 years, 300 more than 300,000 acres um, has been have been um, completely destroyed. Um, and again, we're not talking about just deforested, but basically completely degraded um, with profound changes to the hydrology, soils, uh, and of course the um, the the above ground biomass. Um, 30% of the deforested lands have been converted to mining ponds. We'll be talking about that and some of the work that we're doing on trying to characterize that and understand that dynamic. Um, that was one of the, um, one of our first papers in 2018 actually determined that number. I mean, people saw it, but there wasn't a quantification. Uh, and we're talking about um, 30, more, more than 30,000, 40,000 hectares of essentially the largest anthropogenic wetland uh, in, um, in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and then artificial gold mining releases 185 tons of mercury into the water, uh, into the lakes and rivers of the region per year. Um, and this is a, the, I, I'm not sure if I have to say, that's a lot of mercury <laughs> and has a lot of effects. Um, I will remind people that if, if you break a thermometer in your in your local school, if you have one of those old thermometers, they'll essentially bring the fire department for essentially half a gram of mercury uh, to shut down the building and have everyone wear uh, Tyvek protective suits and respirators. Um, people regularly walk around with a half a kilo of mercury in their back pocket in a small uh, plastic bottle like you see this fellow here with with no protective equipment. So there's a, there's a different sense of reality of what mercury is, what it can do, and, and whether or not it should be released. And of course, the consequences of that are something that we'll, we'll look into in just a bit. Um, so my group is, uh, I'm the executive director of the Center for Amazonian Scientific Innovation, or in Spanish, Centro de Innovación Científica Amazonica, or CINCIA. I'll be referring to CINCIA. Uh, and essentially, we have several, this is, this is a center um, uh, created by Wake Forest University with funding for major funding from um, USA, WWF, uh, ESRI, um, and, and, other, and some, other, uh, some other donors, um, uh, more foundation, to be able to um, essentially uh, power scientific capacity building in the region, build the ability, I mean, build the ability to do science in the region where the transformation is uh, is happening. This is essentially, uh, this has been thought of as, a, as an intractable problem. It's uh, received a fair amount of money and attention to try to stem the flow uh, and create uh, knowledge and solutions. Um, so uh, we're trying something different where we're using science um, to develop uh, sustainable innovations, um, based on scientific knowledge and, and modification of techniques that uh, have been used in other places um, for things related to reforestation, restoration and remediation of lands, um, understanding uh, mercury in the environment, its dynamics and ways to potentially mitigate the effects. Um, the use of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning related to drones and satellites, given now that uh, data availability is, is much better than has been. Um, the ability to transform all that information into policy intelligence to really inform and, and kind of uh, zero in on, uh, on how to change things, right? Figure out where the rubber hits the road. So there is a conservation aspect to this and, of course, education. Um, and we'll talk about what education is and what the, what the uh, parameter, I mean, what the, the different aspects of, of, of that uh, are, is for the work that we do. So first of all, um, you know, characterizing many times starts with the use of remote sensing. It's now relatively inexpensive. Um, when Matt and I were in grad school, um, we, we both spent time in uh, the University of Michigan uh, SNRE's uh, GIS and remote sensing lab. It was extraordinarily expensive to just get one Landsat scene. I think it was something like four or $5,000, which was an unimaginable amount when I was a grad student. And now this stuff's free. You just pull it down. I can look at it on my phone. Um, and also that's 30 meter resolution. I can get three meter and actually even get one meter resolution also on my phone. So uh, we've moved from um, not having enough data to having too much data. And, and now what do we do with all this data and how do we process this quickly? 
Um, but um, but now we have this. So using multiple sensors to expand on the power of Earth observing satellites, um, and using both optical uh, optical and radar to detect um, and mining in these Amazon landscapes is is one of the major goals for us. Um, so we've actually you know, been uh, developing new remote sensing methods to reveal um, the history of illegal mining. To be able to do this more effectively, we created a method that basically uh, leverages work that Greg Gassner has done with his class light system, the Carnegie Land uh, analysis system, um, which basically uses spectral and mixing to, to get better resolution um, uh, from Landsat data and uh, really zero in on a methodology to, uh, to segment um, deforestation from mining and not from anything else. That's been a standing problem. Um, actually, we kind of cracked that nut and published this uh, a few years back in remote sensing. And, and we use that to develop uh, a timeline, basically what has happened uh, for a 35 year uh, arc. Um, so we can understand how it's changed. So um, we have now uh, essentially all the deforestation going back to 1985. We can separate it by mining type as well, because now we have a sense of uh, whether, the, you know, what kind of technology, whether it's kind of really um, kind of a uh, um, guy with a pickaxe and, uh, and some shovels and wheelbarrows, or are we talking uh, front loaders? Um, and that has a, that has a, a very profound um, effect on how you re reforest areas. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But basically allows us to construct these sorts of timelines. This is an animation that shows essentially 20, 37 years of deforestation in Madre de Dios. You see the scale there is 40 kilometers. So we're talking about very large areas. And you see how um, things change. Uh, in the middle, there's a dotted line. That is a highway that was built, like kind of a US quality uh, highway that was built through the center of uh, protected areas. Um, it was in environmentally and ecologically, sorry, it, uh, economically important. But essentially, it was the trigger that pr started the perfect storm. Um, where uh, it decreased the cost of transportation, increased access for people in other regions to go and find their fortunes in the gold fields of Madre de Dios. And of course, the gold field sounds like it's a flat, you know, sand lot or something. It's actually a, a mature, pristine rainforest. And the thing you have to do is cut it down first before you do any mining. So essentially, um, that uh, has created the dynamic. And this is extraordinarily fast. Um, and, and especially for the level of disturbance that we're seeing here. It also allowed us, of course, to, to, to relate not just the spatial information, but the, just the, the magnitude and tied to the price of gold, where we see really close association to uh, deforestation and the price of gold. So we're seeing the signal that really this is, yes, about governance, yes, about um, uh, access, but it really is the price of gold that's driving much of this. Um, we also are doing a lot with drones. I mean, we want to, we're doing work to develop new vehicle sensor and analysis methods uh, to realize the promise of drones for science and conservation. And essentially everyone seems to have a drone nowadays, but we, you know, drone for me is just a flying camera um, and cameras basically just collect pictures and data. So we have to do something with that and process it in a way that uh, we can extract knowledge. Um, so we build custom um, uh, you, uh, drone fixed wing airframes uh, at the at the bio department over at Wake Forest, um, and we have a, we, there are several of our drones here. Um, some of these, the larger ones, um, can travel 50 uh, sorry 500 miles. They're gas powered uh, drones, um, and it can carry about uh, six kilo, five kilos uh, on on a on a on a very full tank. Um, if necessary, and so we can put um, lots of different sensors on it. So we're not just doing optical, we can do red edge we, um, uh, to be able to, to capture more information, thermal as well, um, so we can get information both day and night. Um, and essentially one of the things that we want to detect is the machinery of, uh, of gold mining. Um, traditionally, when you take a look at something like this, you're looking for the deforestation that's caused by the driver. Um, uh, that's kind of to a certain extent a little too late because it's already showing that there's a patch of forest, forest that's been clear cut. Um, but if you if we can detect the machinery, it can give us uh, a sense of what's going to happen in the near future. So here there's a sluice, basically uh, a place where um, uh, sediments are sifted. There's the dredge, which is a floating essentially suction pump, uh, which is sucking uh, sediments at the bottom of this uh, of this 
I wouldn't even say this is a river. This is basically was forest and was blasted out with mining ponds that's filled up with water. So basically this was forest and it's now just floating in a hole that's filled with water. Um, and, uh, and these are a bit challenging because it's almost like finding, trying to find Waldo. Um, they, it's hard to detect, um, especially with uh, satellites of medium resolution. So drones are critical. And at the, the, uh, the way we fly them, we're getting centimeter uh, resolution data so we can see stuff. However, um, I don't think anybody's got enough graduate students to be able to do the analysis visually, uh, which is a problem. Um, so we're actually um, looking to figure out how to process these really challenging images. Here are some mining shacks, and these fellows are uh, avoiding detection because they know that sometimes uh, the military police goes and do overflight, so they're putting their shacks under the trees, so it's harder to see. Um, but essentially, we need to use, we need to do this uh, better. We need to use, we're using deep learning algorithms to automate drone image analysis to find these threats. So we're processing um, tens and thousands of images, creating uh, neural nets um, uh, for training to create a, basically a gold mining library um, to train these, uh, these CNNs to be able to do object detection. And for those that are not familiar, this is very similar to the technology that's used uh, essentially by Facebook and uh, Google for analyzing your photos. Take a picture of your friend. It basically trained itself on other pictures of your friends and it, and it allows you to start to uh, recognize things. So what we want to recognize are dredges, floats, sluices, and campments. Um, so we have uh, uh, a lot of work to collect the data and then actually tag them. So we create those libraries and then uh, we're training these, these uh, data. So essentially, if we see something like this, the system will uh, put bounding boxes on the elements and we know what they are. So essentially, we've uh, been developing a cloud-based automatic recognition system for mining equipment in both uh, drone and high resolution satellite data streams. Uh, essentially, we're doing transfer learning, which basically links those together um, using different machine learning techniques. And we've actually um, also been applying them not just to um, anthropogenic elements based or, or uh, human elements like, like mining ponds, but, but features of the post -line mining landscape. So what we want to do also is find dark mining, which is mining that occurs on rivers and beaches and in the river bends. Um, there are beaches in the Amazon because the river goes up and down maybe 10 meters between uh, wet and dry season. So these are essentially these tailing mounds that are found in rivers, but it's really hard to see uh, because there are a lot of similarities with river beaches. So it's hard to detect. We, we estimate between 15, between 10 and 15 percent of the, uh, of the mining that occurs in the Amazon is not detected using t traditional techniques because they're looking for forest loss. And there's no forest loss here. Um, this also works for areas that have been mined previously and are being remined. Uh, and that's important, not necessarily from the deforestation angle, but as we'll see, because of the mercury release, because mercury uh, happen, mercury release happens at the same time that uh, deforestation from mining occurs. These areas are, are continue, I mean, right next to areas uh, that could be primary successional forests. So basically, if you can detect this, then you have a sense of what's going to happen in the near future. Again, the idea is like, where are the threats and how will they um, start to affect forests uh, that are close by? Um, so we actually are using the same techniques where we're um, having AI identify these and improve the ability to do these detections in near real time. Um, and, and here's a picture of, uh, of what this looks like. Uh, close up. I mean, bizarre colors, essentially, this is because of sedimentation and algae growth. Um, and there's a logic to it, which which we'll talk about in just a sec. But essentially, ASGM converts forests to water. Um, as I mentioned, 30% of the deforested areas have been turned into it's basically water, open water or, or wetlands, if you will. Um, NASA actually, uh, this is something from the, from the space station um, that was reported about a year and a half ago, where um, they they detected this uh, from space. So it's, it's a vast area. And uh, essentially, we, we helped with some of this uh, in understanding what this was. Um, and essentially, when you take a look at it, and this is in false color, you see that it's a very complicated network. Um, it's, a, it's, uh, it's connected with the, the hydrology that existed before, the streams that existed before. If you take a look at the blow up on the top right corner, you can actually see the remnants of the 
of the bra of the stream now is braided because there's so much sediment there and it's much wider but it actually it kind of oozes across the landscape because now that it's very flat the, the sub uh, the uh, below ground uh, hydrology is very altered so um this is this is something that uh not a lot of work has been done on that and we're, we're trying to get a get a handle on some of these characteristics um when we take a look at it in la pampa which is this mining zone which is kind of been recognized as one of the worst places in the world for this is that as, as I mentioned about uh, about 30 percent um, has been transformed uh, into waters, which also means that it's not going to be reforested or grow back through natural regeneration essentially in our lifetime. So we're losing forests and we're never going to get it back. Um, and this is just indicative of one area in essentially uh, uh, a uh, mining uh, driver that is increasing exponentially across Latin America. Uh, particularly in areas like Brazil, where the government is aiding and abetting for uh, mining to occur in Amazonian contexts, um, we just we just uh, just this week we got uh, um, our, our paper was accepted that worked out the methodology, um, where we basically uh, transferred techniques that are used in medical imaging for uh, detecting uh, automated detection of the mining ponds and tied them to a clock, so we have a sense of when they were abandoned whether they're being reworked and uh, how much time it takes for the, the, the eutrophication to happen. Um, and this allows us to, to accelerate, accelerate the, the processing and identification of these ponds and actually start to get uh, a sense of what their uh, evolution is uh, from essentially a sterile mining pit to uh, essentially a eutrophied lake, because we're talking about um, uh, a tropical ecosystem. So there's a lot of dynamics. There's a lot of colonization by uh, by flora and fauna in these areas. And and for better or worse, there's a new wetland. And there there's birds. There's insects. There's uh, 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 viruses and bacteria there. Um, so we're trying to figure out what's there um, through uh, the work that we're doing uh, in the mining ponds. Um, so again, 30% is uh, deforested. And that means that the mercury releases that we see is going to be defined by these new landscapes and hydroscapes, uh, which uh, has been created by mining. Um, we uh, use uh, all sorts of uh, technology to be able to um, work effectively in a very uh, remote area. So this is us uh, with one of our uh, uh, drones that are on top. Um, these are floating drones, basically a little catamaran. There are sensors. Oops. There are sensors there, so we can, uh, there's sonar in there, so we get the bathymetry um, sensors for pH, conductivity, a whole bunch of other stuff. So we kind of zoom, uh, put them around, so we're trying to characterize what the, uh, what they are and tie them to what we see in space, uh, remote, remotely sensed. Um, also, we're doing a lot of work with plankton. Uh, we're going to be doing some work uh, with uh, viruses and bacteria in the later this year or early next year. Uh, to understand kind of like the base of that food chain of how is that uh, evolving and, and particularly uh, with the question for mercury. Um, yeah, we're doing coring of these these uh, oxbow lakes. This is a case of an oxbow lake, which is one of our controls, but also in, uh, in a lot of studies doing um, uh, comparative studies to see how they compare to the natural lakes, all these mining ponds. Um, as I just mentioned, plankton, macroinvertebrates and fish, sediments, um, uh, the woman that you see on the, on the on the right is Claudia Vega. She's the director of the Mercury program there um, and of the Mercury Lab that we uh, created. Um, and the Mercury Lab we created is the first analytic Mercury laboratory in the Peruvian Amazon. It's called LAMCA, um, uh, the Laboratory for Mercury and Environmental Chemistry. Um, and and we, we created that in 2017 and still is. We were hoping that this would spur uh, some competition so people would create Mercury Labs since it's such a such a huge issue, um, but not yet. But we are going to be creating a new one in the city of Iquitos in the northern Peruvian Amazon because we'll be starting a new research program there um, for uh, for doing some of the similar work that we've done in Madre Dios. So that's in the region of Loreto, which is northern Peruvian Amazon uh, near the triple border of uh, Colombia and Brazil and Peru. Um, we a couple of years ago we we published a paper that described the spatial distribution of mercury across this, um, tying it uh, to uh, to understand the dynamics and how that ties to to mining as a 
emission source, but also the, the transport and how that ties together with the characteristics of grain size, um, some of the, uh, the, the issue of hydraulics uh, and hydromorphology. Um, that's, that was in Science Advances. Uh, a PhD student, uh, Jackie Gerson, did some amazing work on this um, and, and really provided not only the information about total mercury, which is uh, one is, is all the species of mercury, but methylmercury. And methylmercury is the bioavailable type of mercury that concentrates in fish. It's basically the reason why you're not supposed to eat too much tuna fish, uh, essentially because there is a, a marine uh, uh, biomagnification mechanism that it basically concentrates up to large fish like tuna. Um, that, that dynamic happens not only in marine systems, uh, but it happens in uh, fluvial systems in the Amazon where you're getting a lot of concentration in, uh, in these complex trophic systems where you're getting a lot of uh, bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So um, fish at the top of the food chain uh, are frequently very contaminated with mercury. And if you're eating those, especially if you're an indigenous person that really only eats fish, <laughs> at least for part of the years, you are uh, at risk for uh, mercury, um, uh, methylmercury, um, poisoning, essentially. Um, we also develop methods for measuring atmospheric mercury releases. Um, mercury is released uh, in the air when they burn the amalgams, uh, that the gold uh, uh, mercury mix. So we use active sensors uh, using at atomic uh, absorption spectroscopy. Um, and uh, we can create uh, maps in cities to find out those hotspots. Essentially, we're doing hotspot analysis. Um, that's something we published in Method X a couple years ago or a year and a half ago. We're actually really going into passive air samplers um, where we can, uh, active samplers are expensive and you only have one or two of them. Passive air samplers, uh, you can deploy hundreds or thousands at the same time, low cost, no energy, simply use, and we can analyze them in our laboratories. I have a laboratory as well at Stanford at, at the Carnegie Institution. So we have one in Peru, we'll have two in Peru soon, one in California, so we, we do a lot of processing. And actually we're thinking about creating one in North Carolina uh, for some of the overflow um, that we're doing. So basically this just uses a sulfur impregnated uh, sorbent and basically a cold, cold cream uh, vial. And we put it upside down so the rain and uh, with a mesh so the bugs don't get into it and we'll leave it out there for a month. And basically it's just absorbing it and then we can analyze it. And what that allows us to do is for example, if we want to do some urban studies, we put it across the, the, the city, leave it there for a month, pick them up, and then we can start to do some uh, hotspot analysis. So in this case, um, we recognize here there's a downtown hotspot where all the gold shops are, basically where the gold buyers are, and they basically just torch the gold and release even more mercury into the urban environment. Um, but we also have found a hotspot uh, up there in the north which is in the middle of a residential neighborhood. So somebody was doing something they were not supposed to be doing, probably had a little side gig where they were being gold buyers and uh, essentially creating a hotspot for all their neighbors. So and that's not good. Um, we passed this information to the, to the Department of Health um, and we hope that that was taken care of, but um, it, it shows the promise of this. We also can do this at large scales. So this is essentially like a 120 kilometer transect and we put them along the highway, and this allows us to actually detect hotspots um, from the mercury signal. So even kind of, you might not see or know about the mining, but you can actually kind of sniff it from the air, if you will. Um, so uh, it allows for detection, but it also allows for understanding what the risk is for populations and for the forests um, that are, are surrounding these mining zones. Um, one thing that is a curious uh, thing is that mercury in, uh, in mining soils are typically lower than in the forest soils. And that's something that really confused us when we saw it. The assumption was, oh, you know, this area must be saturated in mercury. And this essentially is what the, the government and, lo and the local folks kind of intuited, that this is a poison landscape. You can't put it in agriculture. You can't do anything with it. There's no trees, but it's even worse, it's got mercury. But we found the opposite. We found that forests have higher uh, higher than expected, and the mining soils had lower than expected. And uh, it took about three years to work this out, and we just published this recently in uh, two papers, one in Nature Communications and the data paper in Ecology. Um, again, Jackie Gerson uh, did a wonderful job, just really amazing science, that basically 
Um, the diagram on the, on, the, on the left is when you burn these mercury amalgams, uh, there's three pathways for it to, to, trans, to travel. Um, it was initially assumed that it really just kind of dropped out within a few feet. But now we see that there's actually long range tra transport where you have gaseous elemental mercury um, either gets uh, brought down, is converted to a soluble form, basically oxidized mercury that goes into rainwater and then kind of falls down onto soils. Um, or it can be particulate that gets deposited on leaves um, and then falls down as litter fall, uh, uh, gets deposited on leaves and then it rains and it's through fall, or it can be absorbed into the matrix of leaves and then when the leaves fall down, that's litter fall. So we worked out that mechanism. So it's, uh, and that was not really well understood. Um, and essentially we found that the contribution uh, of this mechanism through through litter fall and, and through fall contributes to creating some of the highest mercury soil uh, uh, measurements that we've that have been published in the entire Amazon region. So Los Amigos, which is a, a, a region in Peru now, in, in Peru is now essentially the, the Amazonian hotspot, probably because no one else has actually looked at it very closely. But, but it actually shows that this is, uh, this is a very powerful mechanism. It also says that the forest soils are a bank. They are uh, uh, storing mercury that may be released if there is deforestation or mining that happens. So essentially we're, we're getting uh, mercury stored there. And, uh, and essentially, uh, right in that case, it's not bioavailable, but essentially it's accumulating. So if there's any anthropogenic disturbance, it can be released en masse. Um, and this actually got a lot of press but back in, uh, just about two months ago. There was a New York Times article that reported on, on our nature communications paper. It was reported in Science and Scientific American. Uh, surprisingly, we got, got a lot of press because it, it was uh, a, a really nice finding, I think. We also do work with indigenous communities. So we evaluate the mercury impact on native communities, um, essentially through uh, analysis of hair. Um, and what we found was essentially uh, more than 75% of the population have mercury levels above the World Health Organization's uh, recommended levels. Um, very, well, um, very highly impacted. This was a study of uh, about one and a half percent of the population of Madre de Dios, which is uh, a region, a state the size of South, of South Carolina. Um, so, and, and very concerningly, 65% of children had levels uh, above these, uh, the WHO recommended levels. Um, that's concerning because children are very uh, susceptible to neurological damage caused by mercury contamination. Um, and, uh, and also we found the community, uh, indigenous communities are the most effective, so affected. So seven of the 10 villages or communities that uh, had the highest levels were indigenous. Uh, with levels that were more than twice that of uh, non-indigenous communities, and mainly because they eat fish all the time, um, and they have limited access to information. Um, we found essentially we we found the community in, that has uh, the highest levels yet reported, um, and we have a study with the Wake Forest uh, School of Medicine for assessing their cognitive impairment in these populations. And we're just ready to get ready to publish that paper uh, to work out a new model to, to understand what the effects are and how you measure it uh, with communities that were in first contact 30 years ago. Um, can't use those same tests that we use uh, here in the States or in Europe. There needs to be other methods. Uh, so stay tuned for that one. Um, and, and finally, we, we do a lot of work on reforestation. So, all right, we found out what all the problems are. What are we going to do about it? One of the most important things, both from a from a recovery of uh, of fauna, but all, uh, but also a flora, but also fauna, um, and stabilization of mercury transfer, as we saw in the banks, is to reforest. Basically, lay down uh, something that consolidates the soil, builds back that uh, lost biomass, especially the carbon biomass. So we created uh, a um, the largest reforestation and remediation experiment in the Americas. So 120 acres of experimental plots testing 70 species of name, native Amazonian trees. Um, we created a reforestation method that's now being used by the National Park Service in Peru for uh, reforesting the Tambopata National Reserve. They've done about 800 hectares to date, and they're going to be having to do a lot more. Um, so we're very, we're very pleased that they're using our methodology, uh, which we call the Cincia method. 
very uh, un, un, uncreatively, but basically that, that accelerates uh, the establishment. And essentially what we're doing is, is planting tropical trees in deserts. So this is essentially the worst case scenario. Like you don't want to do this, but we, try, we actually figure out how we can do this using three models, the, what we call the kind of the ecological model for protected areas, conservation areas, um, a full uh, economic one, which it has uh, uh, trees and non-timber forest project products that can be harvested through a 30 year cycle, and then something in the middle. So basically if you want farmers to use it, they're gonna want some payback uh, if, if they're gonna plant it. And if you're gonna do it in a national park, well, then you can go for the, for the full ecological version of that. Um, We've published on this um, for growth rates, uh, survivorship, mortality, morbidity for native species, how it's been doing. Um, we have some more papers to do because we've got six years of data um, and, and also some methods paper on the use of um, high efficiency uh, nurseries. Because if you're going to reforest 100,000 hectares, you need to create 100,000 hectares worth of baby trees and you have to do it very effectively and efficiently. And we've been working a lot on, on, on getting some know-how from from the private sector on how to grow stuff fast cheaply and in high efficiency um the last thing i'll mention here uh on on this is adapting a native uh amazonian soil improvement technique uh, which was called terra preta in brazil used by indigenous people for centuries but essentially is the creator of biochar um, and doing it in a way that is accessible. So um, right here, you see some 55 gallon drums kind of look like trash, but these are actually high efficiency biochar um, reactors where we're actually burning waste um, Brazil nut husks um, and setting them on fire in, the, in a controlled process to create tons and tons of biochar, which is uh, used essentially uh, in the reforestation uh, thing. So one of the, uh, one of the, the magic sauce here is biochar that's been soaked in microorganisms and some um, uh, organic liquid uh, fertilizer. And you put it basically around the, the root ball um, and then you never touch it again. And the survivorship is, is much higher. So we've published on this as well in forest on, on, the, uh, on the use of this for reforestation in extremely degraded tropical soils. Um, of course, we want to get this information as much as possible. So of course we're publishing in the peer review literature, but we also create essentially what we call uh, research briefs, which are in Spanish and English. And they are meant for uh, government workers, for the press, for decision makers, something which is basically a light version, a lot more pictures, a lot more simplified graphics and key points, basically what you need to know. And, and it shouldn't be more than essentially you know, five or six pages. Um, and this is essentially the primary tool for communicating our science to the policy uh, and the public. Um, so we never give people our papers. We always give them our, our research briefs. Uh, and that means, you know, if there's a journalist or there's a teacher or there's the governor that wants to know him, he, he gets there. You have a link to the paper if you really want to read it. But essentially, uh, we don't put that burden on, on folks that want to uh, know what we've, we've, we've come up with. Um, this information has been used by the Ministry of Environment for social media campaigns. These are basically Twitter posts with some hashtags they created around, uh, around Mercury in this case. Uh, we have an education and communications team, which is fantastic, where we create um, kind of public uh, materials for kids and, and we have them in school. So basically, uh, we have an education team that works with primary and secondary students that have it built into curricula. And right now, 35,000 kids in Madre Dios are now learning about Mercury. And they use things like puppet shows where you have like these little uh, Punch and Judy puppets uh, of one fish uh, eating another fish and transferring Mercury and how that might affect your family. So we try a lot of creativity on, on getting the message out. And, and, and our, our team in Peru that does that work is, is just excellent. Um, so I'll leave you with some of the questions that need answers next for those students that are interested in working in systems like this. Um, one, one of the big things, one of the things that really excites me is the issue of wildfires. I live in California, so wildfires, unfortunately, and smoke is a, is a fact of life every summer. But in the Western Amazon, uh, it is one of the areas that will dry out because of climate change and, it's, and burning is happening already. So we're seeing this, and, and that's important because um, the, it's not just increased carbon release, but the mercury release because of wildfires, um, both in the above ground and the below ground carbon stores 
our soil and in the soils. So there is a lot of concern that uh, that fires will basically create these huge pulses. Um, also, do uh, uh, mining impacts change with mining method? There are two different methods here. This is the the low technology version. This is when you start using uh, bulldozers. Um, and how will wildlife return to these damaged landscapes? Um, you're, you're, you're destroying all the biota as well. So it's not just the flora. So how does it come back? Um, and we, we have a program for climate traps and we're doing some work with WWF on, on a lot of that. Um, and, and also spe specifically using birds and bats as bioindicators, sentinel species for assessing mercury uh, in ecosystems. Um, because we do find that there's a big difference uh, especially in the guild. Uh, just recently, we found the highest reported level of mercury in kingfishers uh, in the Peruvian Amazon around mining zones. Um, that's not something we published yet, but it will be coming out soon, uh, we hope. Um, so that's uh, that's something that's 80 times higher than anything that's been found in the United States, for example, at tremendously high levels. Like, what does that mean for migra migrating uh, species, for the viability of these populations, uh, both the ones that are sedentary and the ones that are migratory? Um, and what are the uh, what are the effects of social interventions? There was a big police action. Did it do something? COVID? Did it do something? Uh, we're, we're using a lot of the tools I described for kind of answering these these policy relevant questions that are critical for conservation in the region. Um, so this is the last slide. I mean, there are lots of problems here: high rates of deforestation, biodiversity loss, widespread mercury contamination, soil quality and carbon loss. Limited ability to produce scientifically robust data is a huge problem. Uh, and also the understanding of what that data is by decision makers. You can give them all the papers and plots, but if they can't understand it, nothing happens. Um, uh, so, and also just low awareness and understanding has to be uh, the responsibility of scientists, I think. Uh, I would say that we have to present the information in a way that actually does something. Otherwise, it's great for the journal, it's great for our careers, but it doesn't change anything. And uh, at least me personally, I'm in it for change. I want some results and some impacts. Uh, and, and I drive my team to, 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 to have that as uh, the guiding principle, that if there is no change, then our science uh, is not as uh, important. And, and this is really uh, informed by the work that's been done around climate change and, and other uh, pressing issues uh, at a global scale. So uh, I lied, it's not my, this is my last slide. Uh, we need to provide technical scientific evidence and innovation. We need to increase the capacity of local scientists to break the, the, the colonial scientist model where just people from the States and Europe or have the answers and all the folks down South uh, just have to sit there and learn and, and carry our bags and, and collect our samples. So we need to actually create these collaborative networks so they can produce the science and, and, and in partnership with, uh, with uh, folks uh, in the North, global North develop tools for governance in private sector, educate public decision makers that have the limited capacity and experience, uh, and then protect these vulnerable forest steward groups. And this is something that unfortunately um, uh, came, I just came from Madre de Dios, and on Sunday there was another environmental defender that was murdered uh, because he was trying to protect the forest uh, from miners. Um, the second person in two years. Um, so this is something that uh, occurs in very rough neighborhoods many times. Um, uh, it was a colleague of ours, um, so it's very sad that this happened. Um, but you know, it is uh, uh, almost like the, the the plot of a chronicle of a death foretold. These people live extraordinarily uh, dangerous lives, and they still do it um, uh, uh, to defend the lands and, uh, and the forest that they love. So with that, I'll leave you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I went a little bit over time, but I hope that we have some time for some questions and and, and a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. That Matt, Matt Baker told me to expect an interesting seminar, but that was a real tour de force. I'm just in awe of the breadth and the scope of all the things that you've managed to work on across the whole range of uh, causes and, and impacts. I'm going to stop talking because we've got some questions already posted. I'm going to call on um, Maggie Holland first. So Maggie, please unmute and ask your question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Luis. This was really fascinating and you've accumulated so much important information to share and so many important 
project components. I love the, just like Joe said in the chat, I love the public facing materials. Um, I just was curious about sort of government response these days to artisanal mining and, and whether there's been any further, I know there were some efforts to think about bringing what is illegal into a legal status and try to have some form of regulation and and legitimization of the activity, but more control and, and what successes that had, if any. And then in addition, kind of curiosity too, I, I'm aware of the violence. And so how do your own research teams, um, you know, relate and uh, to miners in the field? Like, what do they think you're doing and how do they respond? <laughs> Well, so the answer to the second question is related to the first. Um, so um, currently, um, Peru's been is actually one of the countries that is more active uh, on trying to solve the problem. All eight countries of the Amazon have this issue, and it's a growing issue because of the price of gold and, and COVID and everything else has just created this amazing demand for gold. Um, so uh, there are people that are illegal. They're usually in areas they're not supposed to be in, whether it's a park or someone's private land. So illegal is illegal. There are people that have been in a gray zone because it hasn't been regulated. So essentially how to bring them into the formal economy, have them pay taxes, do their environmental impact assessments, et cetera. Um, so that's a long process because, you know, essentially it's been decades without having to pay taxes and people don't want to pay taxes and be, or, you know, have environmental inspectors come back. So it's a slow process that needs to happen. It's happened in, it happened in the States in the seventies when EPA was formed, like nobody wanted to have EPA, but you know, now you do. Um, so it's going to take a while, but, um, but that's created, uh, you know, the need for enforcement and enforcement action has occurred. Um, they've been having some small enforcement actions. It was a very large one in 2019 that kind of brought down the hammer and almost shut it down in my Dios where they bring like 2000, 3000 troops, but of course COVID came and that all, diluted that effort. And now there's a resurgence. And, and the violence that I mentioned is basically part of the resurgence of, of uh, illegal miners that have been funded by narcos coming back. Uh, because unfortunately, they got new capital. Instead of going to a bank, they got the narcos. And the more narcos come with security for their money. So that's that's uh, the unfortunate reality. So related to the security question, um, we work in a rough neighborhood. People that work in this field and, and other resource extractive fields and in contentious area have to deal with this. We remain neutral. We are not, a, you know, we are an academic group. We're, we're as researchers. We are not uh, Greenpeace, uh, nor are we pro minor. We basically create information, disseminate that knowledge to anybody who wants it. So it's open and we kind of try to float above um, this. And we also try to float above all the petty fights that people and institutions have in many times. So we, we try to kind of have this neutrality. Um, it is something that we, we curate very much, uh, especially working with miners because they're part of the solution. For the formal miners and the formalizing minor, miners, to use that term, the ones that are not yet regulated but are in the, in the, in the pathway, they want to do things right, we want to help them. Um, uh, so we all our reforestation plots actually are on miners' lands because those are where the mining places are. So all of them are essentially with local partners uh, and local miners, uh, and they see value once they get it. They're a little, I mean, they're a little uh, wondering what's going on at first, going, why, why do we want to do all this? But, uh, I mean, we've been at it for about six years, and it's worked out very well. And, it's, and it, it powers our, our ability to work and, and do science. Thank you. Thanks. Matt Baker, you are up. Um, my mind is exploding right now. Um, because there's so many different um, avenues, and I'm still trying to get my hand, uh, my head around the the ecological and and the physical impacts that you're doing. And um, you you did answer in your last few slides some of my questions about soil carbon and and microbes and and how those get replaced to the denuded landscape. And I was curious about um, <clears throat> well, before I go any further, I just have to say that this is like the perfect project for you. Um, because it's so all encompassing and this is exactly how your mind works. It's awesome. Um, at least in my mind, the, uh, the thing that I don't fully understand is, is, is how this change to the landscape influences the way that water moves to the landscape. Is it moving less or more than it did before? Uh, it seems like it would be less of all those storage ponds, but then there's, there's probably a lot of evapor evaporation. It's different than the transpiration rates. Has anyone studied that? And then what is the implication of that 
change for uh, the effects of restoration attempts? Yeah. So great question, and, and thanks for the for the comments, Matt. Um, so the because it's is is very profound physical changes. You know uh, what was there before generally is a small stream. Um, in most cases, these are not big rivers that are mined out. They're essentially these have these linear features because they're mining out a stream. So uh, they're digging down and they're creating basically these retention ponds where a lot of the the, the water would would be held in that complex network that false color image shows you basically creates this little uh, network. Um, so a couple of things to remember, this is an area that has a very strong seasonal signal. So you're getting a lot of rain during the rainy season. So then you get things that are cross border. So basically you're getting sloshing of sediments in water and they all start to interconnect. In the dry season, things go down and they start to, and some are isolated that never are connected to the greater stream network some that are seasonally and others that are always. Um, so, um, and because it's mined down pretty far, it can go to 10 meters or more, you're getting a change in the, in the water table and it, because you're also raising the height of the landscape in certain areas because of the tall tailing piles, which can be 10 to 15 meters high. So you're getting kind of a shift of all this. So you're getting sediment movement. You're getting the the seeding of uh, of biota because you know birds will drop fish eggs whenever there's rain uh, during rainy season. You know some of the ponds that are connected are seeded, so you get colonization. Um, you get microbes and algae start to start to eutrophy those. They have a very different trajectory for the ones that are not connected and seasonally collected. We're just trying to figure this out. We're working with uh, some. Uh, we've got some National Academies of Science money uh, for working with a local a university in Lima that's a, a geohydromorphologist to understand some of the connection. We're doing a lot of work uh, using sonar to, to understand how the uh, braiding happens in rivers that are highly impacted and the migration of, under, of uh, uh, benthic dunes and the way that you know, the, the morphology is changing and how that would impact the dynamics to the greater landscape. So, I mean, short answer is that we don't know very much and we're trying to figure out and, and get partners that are interested in digging into this because there's very little published on this. Very, very little published. Even If you're interested, give me a call. Does anybody else have a question they wanna uh, pose? So I'm going to give people a chance to think about it for a moment. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to raise one. I was fascinated. Um, well, I was fascinated by everything, but um, one of the things that caught my attention really was the the uh, when you made the point that the mined soils actually have lower concentrations of mercury, um, and you went through the whole analysis of where a lot of the mercury winds up, um, but you also made the point that the fish. As it works its way up the food chain, you get the, the what we understand to be the normal uh, process of uh, magnification, increased concentrations. So I was trying to think, you know, you've got all these local ponds, um, and Matt was just asking the question about how it affects the disposition of water in the whole landscape. You just talked about that, but then I'm wondering, a lot of the mercury seems to get trapped in the local forest, um, or in the and in the forest soils from litter fall. <laughs> How much of it gets mobilized and ultimately makes its way down through drainage networks into larger rivers and moves farther off site? Do you have any sense about that? You talked about hot spot. Yeah. Um, I just don't know, you know, what the mobility is in that regard. I mean, that that that's a key question, realistically speaking. So, I mean, so uh, just to, uh, so just to um, sketch it out a bit more. Um, you've got these environment, you've got the two types of releases. One's that's released directly to the rivers, essentially through the mining process, uh, where there's, you release basically mercury contaminated soils um, after you do the amalgamation. So most of the, the, the most of the mass of uh, waste mercury is basically dumped into the rivers uh, and ponds and lakes. So um, the other major input is through the atmospheric uh, release of the burning of the amalgam. So that's the one that basically uh, goes to the forest and can be captured. However, that's only a fraction, and we don't know what the what the balance, what the mass balance is on that side, because there's a lot of it that just gets deposited directly onto uh, into water systems. So basically, it'll rain out and go right into a river, or a stream, or something. 
So there's a lot that goes directly to the um, to the uh, aquatic ecosystem, and that's where it becomes bioavailable immediately. When it goes to the forest soil, forests and the soils, I mean, we just worked out the mechanism. We really don't know a scale what the scale of that is. Um, we're going to be doing some modeling uh, and and some more work on that. There's another paper I think in the series that's well, will be coming out probably in the next six or eight months. Um, so we're trying to get a handle on on what that mass balance in terms of dynamics is, and that's in in a, in a region because uh, and and I should say that's important because. Uh, one one uh, important uh, thing is that the dynamics and direction flow can be very different for the aquatic, with the mercury that goes in the aquatic systems because that goes downstream. In uh, so it's going down watersheds, but uh, the atmospheric release goes up airsheds. So in the case of Mayo Dios, they're going in opposite directions. So the footprint, so the envelope of mercury impacts with aquatic and atmospheric is much larger than was previously assumed because we didn't work, we have this knowledge about that. In terms of connecting this to the greater Amazonian system, which is eight countries, one of the largest watersheds in the world, still a lot to be there because you're now overlapping with mining all along the, all the rivers to a certain extent, all the way down to uh, the Atlantic. So the Madre de Dios is the headlands of the Beni, and then it's the Madeira, which is the second largest um, um, uh, a tributary of the Amazon. This happens in all the other parts of it. So you're getting this additive effect and they're overlapping. So it starts to become a very complex problem that we have to uh, do science along the way, but just try to characterize the dynamics enough to get a first cut on what the transfer is. Um, there have been some papers using isotope analysis where we're actually, we're working with uh, Bridget Berquist at the uh, University of Toronto, uh, we're doing a lot of isotope uh, work uh, with the isotopes of mercury, not carbon and, and, and nitrogen, to, to use it for fingerprinting to figure out source uh, and distance. So there's, we've done a bit of work where uh, we can detect it 500 kilometers downstream, downstream. So it goes down in the aquatic systems really far. We don't know what the airshed is and how far that goes. Um, but we hope to get a sense of that in the coming years with some, some new experiments we're doing. So uh, again, incomplete answer because we just don't know. A lot of work to be done there um, for students and postdocs that are interested in, in, a, in a really interesting and relevant uh, question. Well, you just uh, confirmed how awesome the scope is of this entire research enterprise. Um, I'm going to ask you one last small scale question because it caught my attention when you pointed out the hot spots in some of these urban neighborhoods and said they were where gold traders were operating, but that's not after they already have the gold in metallic form. They are, they are actually burning uh, to release mercury when they're trading it. What's yeah. That? So, I mean, this is really kind of mom and pop shop. Even the ones that have storefronts is, is basically a guy with a digital scale, a little cup and a blowtorch, usually gasoline or compress or, or propane. So uh, a miner will come and has that little uh, amalgam I showed at the very beginning of my talk, that little thing. Um, that was uh, the, after the first burn. When you, when you do the, um, uh, the amalgamation, you saw in that CNN video that somebody was basically stepping in a, in a, in a barrel and using their legs as multi-mixers uh, to mix mercury in, in sediment that contains gold. Uh, it basically looks like a little round ball, which is 50% mercury, 50% uh, gold, you need to get rid of the mercury to get the gold. So you just heat it up and you put a blowtorch on it and you burn it off. Um, you then take that and you have to sell it and you go to town and you never burn off all the mercury is maybe 5% there. So when the gold trader gets it, he doesn't want to pay gold prices for mercury because it's a lot more expensive. So it's, it's in his best interest to get a oxyacetylene blowtorch and fire that thing and if possible, melt it down and if it only has propane, you're just going to heat it up as much as you can. And when, and there's and he basically releases it into the room, or it goes out the front door, or if he's got a chimney, and most don't, it would go out to everybody else. Um, so that these are basically little urban hotspots. And and we've done some work, and this actually dates from my work when doing this uh, when I was with EPA, where a one like basically a one-person gold shop can release as much mercury as a two-megawatt coal-fired power plant. Uh, and there's maybe 25 in Puerto, and there are tens of thousands around the Amazon. So we're talking about a lot of mercury 
in just in the atmospheric, which is the smaller fraction than the stuff that's released directly into the rivers. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, it, it, it kind of starts to boggle the mind once you start to add all this up into, into a system, which, which is actually why it's so fascinating. Uh, and Matt, you're right. Uh, this is like, I, I love this stuff because it's a complex system. I actually, I'm a complex system scientist as well. And basically seeing how all these things in the scale uh, dependent factors, path dependence, uh, and all these emerging uh, emergent effects uh, is, is really fascinating. Thanks so much. Um, before we stop, I'm, I see Pete Chirko. I don't know if you noticed, Pete did actually come in. Hey, Pete. So I want to give a shout out. Chief Pete, if you want to say hi before we before we conclude the seminar, please. Yeah, I just want to just say hi. It's nice to see Luis again. We've been on several calls recently um, since I just, um, you know, have a lot of tie-ins with Luis's work. It's in, it's in very impressive to watch a, a talk from Luis to see all of the different work that's being done. Tremendous impact, high impact articles uh, in, in many different aspects of the science. So I just want to say thanks to that. But it's also good to hear that there's still much work to be done so that, you know, hasn't crowded out all of us who who wish to make an impact in this field. So, uh, um, so, so, so really good. And I would say that, like, you know, just from the work that I'm working on, too, is there are, there are some significant questions related to uh, the geomorphology and the geology of the deposits themselves. We know very little about those and 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 a lot about the the systems, uh, the geologic systems as well. So it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. Thanks. Yeah. So if I could actually just give a just a, a quick little plug for for students that are interested in coming down and doing research. So a lot of the work that we do is through partnerships of uh, grad students, uh, postdocs, and visiting faculty. Um, so essentially, we have you know we're doing a lot of work with the with with the the funding that we have but what one thing that we do for at Cincy is that we set it up there and i think i mentioned that it's feel it's a field forward science basically we're at the spot we have the laboratories we have a, a small building uh we have office space we have uh field teams to go out um, and essentially it's a node for researchers that want to do this kind of work um to to gather at so essentially you can become an affiliated researcher at Cincy. Uh, and we have an affiliates program, and what that basically means is that you get the space, you know, you get a hot desk if you need it, an internet connection, and a community of practice of researchers, mainly Latin American researchers, uh, and some folks that from the U.S. or Europe that that may be visiting at one time or another, um, to 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 basically bounce ideas off each other. If there's any synergies of going to the field together, that can be discussed and worked out. Um, I mean, the idea is that, you know, we don't provide funding or anything like that. You would come with your own. But basically, uh, what we have is access to a very unique uh, ecosystem and a very unique uh, system to come visit. Um, so, you know, we have people that stay for a couple of days and sometimes they stay for uh, a, a year. Uh, we have a, a research from the University of Maryland at Car uh, College Park that are spending, a, a, I think, 14 months uh, with the Mercury program. Um, doing work on mercury and soils. Uh, we've had other people stay nine months or, uh, or come back every year for their entire dissertation work, uh, as the case of Jackie Gerson, who did four years. Um, so a lot of opportunities to go there. Um, it, always, it always is good if you have a good idea of what you want to do and, and do your legwork before you come down, uh, because everyone's busy doing science. Uh, but uh, again, the idea is for this to be a node and to sum the efforts uh, for for impact. We, we the only thing we would ask is that you start giving talks down there and talk to your science. I mean, uh, speak your. I mean, uh, discuss your science with colleagues uh, and and local folks. And if you speak Spanish, even better. Okay. Well, that is a great way to end the seminar. I'm going to stop the recording in just a moment. We will send the link. We will post the link uh, to the YouTube recording so that uh, many more people get a chance to watch this. Thanks so much for just an absolutely fascinating seminar. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Okay.